first appearance, this sounds like a pretty far-fetched idea. The space exploration really damage Earth's ozone layer. After all, the Earth's atmosphere is by our scale, fairly large and complex, but our rockets are small, so how could space exploration itself significantly damage our ozone layer? Well, as it turns out, this may be possible, at least in the near future, and it is a very complicated issue. Space exploration always leaves behind a lot of debris, some of which we never before considered. This is not surprising, because increasing technological sophistication is typically more complex than we can anticipate. Once upon a time, we didn't know what carbon dioxide could do to our environment, but now we do. We didn't know what methane, chlorofluorocarbons, or burning fossil fuels could do to our environment, but now we do. Space travel has really just begun for humanity, and it has accelerated rapidly. Many countries, including some considered developing, now send satellites into orbit, or on exploratory missions, and after that, if they return to Earth, they are generally allowed to disintegrate in our atmosphere upon re-entry. But these launches and re-entries leave residue, because technology is very messy, and except in the weird quantum world, nothing is either created or destroyed. The world of quantum physics, with its virtual particles and quantum foam, is rather different from the world we think we know. Technology always has consequences, and just as we had no idea what burning fossil fuels would do over the long term, we still have little or no idea of what launching rockets do to our atmosphere. There are ongoing plans to make spaceflight commercial. This means frequent launches and re-entries. We need to know what this may do to the environment. The central question is, do rocket launches of any type, not just for the purpose of space exploration, but for any purpose, damage the atmosphere, or our environment in general? Let's take a brief look. The ozone layer is what prevents us, and all life on Earth, from being fried by ultraviolet radiation from the Sun. The ozone layer is a stratum of our stratosphere that exists from heights of 8 to 10 miles to 25 to 30 miles above the surface, 13 to 16 or 40 to 48 kilometers, with some variation. Ozone, or O3, is a gas composed of trioxygen, a form of molecular oxygen, consisting of three atoms of oxygen. It occurs throughout our atmosphere, from the troposphere, meaning ground level, to the stratosphere. Although it is a poisonous gas, it is protective to life on Earth because in the stratosphere, it absorbs several wavelengths of ultraviolet light, and without it, the surface of the Earth would be sterilized. This is why the hole in the ozone layer, first discovered in 1982, caused alarm. When it became apparent that the hole was growing, and probably due to the escape of chlorofluorocarbons, known as CFCs, and hydrofluorocarbons, known as HFCs, both widely used in industry and manufacturing. It took only one meeting day in 1987 for the entire political world to unanimously approve the Montreal Protocol, limiting and eventually eliminating ozone-depleting substances. This protocol was based on an agreement made several years earlier in Vienna. The good news is the whole size is reducing and is on track to completely repair itself, providing no further damage is caused. The damage from these launches are still negligible at the moment, but will inevitably get worse if attempts at mitigation aren't taken seriously and pursued. Briefly, ozone or O3 is fairly unstable and reactive. In particular, UV radiation splits ozone molecules into what is narrowly and technically considered molecular oxygen, or O2, and atomic oxygen, or O. These normally recombine, however, chlorine and bromine, both present in rocket exhaust, will capture the atomic oxygen, rendering it unavailable to recombination with O2 to recreate O3, and this results in ozone layer depletion. During winter months at the poles, and especially over Antarctica, the lack of solar radiation, including UV radiation, tends to leave O3 molecules intact so that there is little free atomic oxygen, or O, to be captured by chlorine and bromine. But spring and summer change this situation. At the same time, polar vortices, or whirlpools, in the atmosphere constrain these areas of active O3 destruction to discrete areas over the poles. And this results in the notorious ozone holes again, particularly at the South Pole.
Humans have been shooting things into space since the late 1950s. Some of these launches are publicised, some unknown, but certainly a large number of them are at least semi-secret or even top secret. Either way, the frequency of these launches is accelerating. There are communication satellites, spy satellites, weather satellites, GPS satellites, exploratory vehicles, and so on. The near-Earth orbital zone is now choked with satellites, both operational and defunct, to the point where newer orbital craft have to dodge this stuff, as well as each other, and also miscellaneous non-functional debris from prior launches. The amount of space junk in orbit is truly staggering. In addition, we are at the doorstep of regular, frequent, commercial spaceflight, which has to be frequent in order to be profitable. Some airlines are projecting, in the near future, flights into the stratosphere to shorten the duration of international flights. These latter vehicles will not only go up intact, but obviously will also come back down intact, with their passengers still alive and happy. And these vehicles are intended to be used repeatedly, just as conventional aircraft are now. Most, though not all, things that we launch, once they go up, are expected to come down at some point. Whether going up or coming back down, there are consequences. However, this has barely been studied at all, just because no one thought to do so. After all, what importance are a few space launches and re-entries per year within the context of the entire world and its atmosphere? This depends quite a lot on whether the propellant is solid or liquid fuel, because the chemistry is different. Nearly all the research has been done on solid fuel, because that was universally the preferred propellant for decades, since far less time is required to fuel a rocket with it. However, in recent years, liquid propellants have regained prominence, but very little research has been done on their effects on the atmosphere, and in particular, the ozone layer. This again has been because rocket launches have been relatively rare, whereas CFCs and HFCs have been present in industry and household appliances for many decades. But black carbon, or soot, fluorine, bromine, and aluminium oxides, or almina, are all byproducts of rocket launches. Black carbon absorbs sunlight, but it actually creates a neat blanket throughout the atmosphere. Alumina is reflective, but it also reflects heat rising from the Earth's surface. Together, black carbon and alumina cause warming, at the same time as chlorine and bromine, are destructive to the ozone layer. Re-entry residue is simply what is called space junk, and there is a heck of a lot of it up there. Very little has been done to date to address this growing orbital clutter, but attention has recently been focused on this matter, and there are tentative plans to try and retrieve some of this material. The reason is that now, this mass of uncontrolled material is beginning to present a genuine hazard to further space launches and orbits, but for the present, this material has been allowed to remain in disintegrating orbits, and to eventually fall back to Earth. The assumption is that almost nothing of it will actually reach the ground before it burns up. Even if this is true, as seems to be the case, the burning up part itself is problematic. Besides the soot or black carbon problem, which is a pollutant in itself, rockets and satellites are essentially computers, and computers rely on their operation on highly toxic substances, like rare earths, also called rare metals. These elements are not actually rare in the sense of being scarce. Rather, they are dispersed instead of appearing in discrete deposits like coal, gold, silver, and other substances tend to be. Because rare earths are so thinly spread out, they are difficult to mine, and require considerable effort to retrieve, and mining rare earths is tremendously destructive and polluting. Obviously, reusable launch vehicles would solve some of this problem, since it is fantastically wasteful and expensive to have to build a new rocket every time you want to launch something. This was a major rationale for the American Space Shuttle program, and the former Soviet Union also attempted a shuttle program, until they realised just how expensive it would be. The technological difficulties of getting a launch rocket to land safely have seemed insurmountable. Private companies like SpaceX have been working furiously to overcome these difficulties, since they have the money and don't need to get past any governmental legislative body. This latter consideration can involve prolonged delays, and there is always the risk of funding cancellations. There are people who bemoan the entry of private companies into what once were national space programmes, but these national programmes are argued to be at the whims of politicians who typically have no real appreciation for the scientific objective involved. In the 1990s, for instance, the Superconducting Supercollider, or SSC, 
would have been larger and more powerful than the current Large Hadron Collider, but funding was cancelled by the US Congress after construction had already begun. This was thought to be because the politicians in the US Congress couldn't seem to grasp the importance of research into basic subatomic physics. The point here is that private companies have the money, and the motivation, to do things that governments often cannot, and this applies to something as obviously desirable as reusable launch vehicles. This, in a nutshell, is the issue with space launches on the ozone layer. Without the ozone layer, we're all dead, fried meat and carbonized vegetables. This is not a desirable state of things. However, very little attention has been paid to the damage done to the atmosphere and environment in general by rocket launches. Something is most assuredly happening up there, but we really don't understand what this is. We don't have any idea of whether liquid propellants are better or worse than solid propellants, and we really should be trying to find this out. We should also be researching and creating alternative propellants that may not be as damaging as the current ones. Ideally, we'd be solving all of these issues before they even became issues. But time, greed, fame and curiosity makes this highly unlikely. We need only take a look at history to know this is true. Humanity's space programs are in their early infancies. But now is the time to find out how damaging these programs are. Not after the damage has become obvious and critical. We can't afford to continue to be stupid or ignorant of this. Space exploration is incredibly exciting and promising, but we need to go about it with careful consideration. <laughs>